Welcome to lecture 1.4, Group Presentations. So recall that our informal definition of a group was a collection of actions that obeyed so-called rules 1 up to 4. This is not the ordinary definition of a group. So over the course of the next few lectures, we will be working towards introducing the standard and more formal definition of a group. So along the way, we will learn about some helpful tools to get us there. Now in this lecture, we will introduce group presentations. Well, we actually saw it briefly at the end of last lecture. This is an algebraic device to concisely describe groups by their generators, we've seen th those for a while, but also relations, which is something that we just saw at the end of last lecture briefly. So for example, the following is a presentation for a group that we are familiar with. So what group has two generators, let's call them A and B, with the properties that A squared is equal to 1, b squared is equal to 1, and ab equals ba. Can you think of a group like that? What about the rectangle puzzle? Like, let's let a and b be horizontal flip and vertical flip. Do you agree that the horizontal flip, do it twice, you get the identity? You vertically flip twice, you get the identity, and the order does not matter? This is the Klein 4 group, or the rectangle group. Okay, so recall that arrows in the Cayley diagram represent one choice of generators of the group. In particular, all arrows of a fixed color or type correspond to the same generator. Our choice of generators influence the resulting Cayley diagram. When we have been drawing Cayley diagrams, we have been doing one of two things with the nodes. First, we've been labeling the nodes with configurations of a thing we're acting on. We did that when we started with a rectangle puzzle. Remember how each node of the rectangle of the Cayley diagram was some configuration? Um, secondly, sometimes we leave the nodes unlabeled. We might call this the abstract Cayley diagram. Now there's a third thing we can do with the nodes, and this is motivated by the fact that every path in the Cayley diagram represents not only a configuration of the thing we're acting on, but an action of the group. So we can actually label the nodes with actions. And we might call this sometimes a diagram of actions. Let me try to motivate this. So let's take one node, any one you want, and distinguish that as the unscrambled configuration. So it's like the rectangle puzzle, but the unscrambled version. Or it's the Rubik's Cube in its solved state. And let's label that particular node with the identity action. Usually we call it E. And then we can label each remaining node with the action that it takes us to reach it from the unscrambled state. So let's do an example. Uh, recall the Klein 4 group, or the rectangle puzzle. Um, if we use a horizontal flip and a vertical flip as generators, then here is the Cayley diagram labeled by configurations out here on the left, and here's the unlabeled Cayley diagram on the right. So let's apply the steps to the abstract Cayley diagram for V4 using the upper left hand node as the unscrambled configuration. So in other words, let's label this node with E and then let's label each of these three nodes with the action that it takes to get here. So he, to get to here, um, that's the blue arrow, that's the horizontal flip, let's, so let's call this H. Let's call this, this one down here, that's V. And let's call this one down here, well, we could call it VH or we could call it HV. Doesn't matter. Let's call it VH. Okay, so here's a prettier version of that right down here. And note what I said earlier is that we could have labeled this node with HV instead of VH. They're the same element in the group. Okay, so let's summarize the process that we just did. Let's call it the node labeling algorithm. So the following steps transform a Cayley diagram into one that focuses on the group's actions. So first of all, choose a node as our initial reference point and label it with E. This will correspond to our identity action. Next, relabel each remaining node in the diagram with a path that leads there from the node E. If there's more than one path, and there's typically a lot more than one path, and well, technically infinitely many paths, pick any one. But generally, the shorter one is better. It's simpler. 
Finally, distinguish arrows of the same type in the same way. So either color them, label them, dash versus solid, or so forth. This is nothing different than what we've done before. They correspond to different generators. So our convention will be to label the nodes with sequences of generators so that reading the sequence from left to right indicates the appropriate path. And I will give a quick warning that some authors use the opposite convention. In other words, they think of a, when they see a sequence of generators, they read them from right to left because that's how you would read them if it, if it were like function composition. But for this class, I am always going to read things from left to right. Okay, so a neat thing about the Cayley diagram with nodes labeled by actions is that they act as a group calculator in some sense. For example, if we want to know what particular sequence is equal to, we can just chase the sequence through the Cayley graph starting at the identity. Let's try one. So in the client 4 group, what action is, is this thing equal to? H, 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 V, H, V, V, H, V. Let's try it. Let's start at the identity. And H is the blue arrow, and V is the, is the red arrow. So H, 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 V, H, V, V, H, V. That's equal to H. So a better way to write this is something like this. We say, is this thing here? I would rather write that as H cubed, V, H, V squared, H, V, which is more simply equal H. So a concise way to describe V4 is by the following group presentation. And again, more on this later. So V4 is generated by V and H, two actions, subject to the following relations. V squared is equal to the identity. Well, that makes sense. V squared is the identity. H squared is the identity. H squared is the identity. And VH equals HV. So VH equals H. Here's another example we've seen before, D3. So this is the triangle puzzle group, and it's generated by 120 degree rotation R and a horizontal flip F. And so my choice of colors red and blue match the choice of arrows red and blue down here. So let's take the shaded triangle up here to be the unscrambled configuration. Remember, it does not matter which one we use. So. Here are two different ways of many that we can label the nodes with actions. So this one, we're going to start and label this with the identity. So we can call this one R. We can call this one R squared. We call this F. This one down here, we can say it's F R. And this one down here, we can say it's F R squared. Now there are other ways to do that. Here's another one. As before, this is E, and so let's label this with R, and R squared, and this with F. But now down here, before, we said that was F, R. But now, let's call it R squared, F. And then down here, last time we said F, R squared, but we instead we could have done R, F. So here, we can see that F, R equals r squared f, and f r squared equals r f. So the following is one of many presentations for this group. So d squared is generated by r and by f, and r cubed is the identity, f squared is the identity, and r squared f equals f r. So in other words, this equals that. And I say it's one of many presentations because instead of this last thing here, I, I could have said, well, instead of this being equal to that, I could have said that equals that. I, I could have replaced this thing with F R. Well, that's, not, that's not a very good, um, let's see if I can erase that. Make that bigger. F R equals um, R squared F. And as I said, there are many ways you can label the nodes. If you really wanted to, you could call this node um, F R R or F R squared F. But you know, why would you want to do that? Okay, so at this point, I need to clarify something that was a little bit sloppy. I said earlier. So in the first two lectures, I would write something like this. I said, 
G is generated by the elements H and V. And when I said that, well, all, the, all that I was saying was that H and V generate G, but I didn't say how they generate G. And that's the point of a group presentation. It doesn't just say what generates the group, but how they do. So if we want to be more precise, we use, again, a group presentation that looks like this. And these are what we've seen in the previous couple of slides. G is generated by these elements subject to the following relations. And so this, this vertical bar can be thought of as meaning subject to. For example, the following is a presentation for V4. And we, we used V and H before, but we can use A or B or anything else we want to. So uh, V4, again, is generated by A and B. Both of those elements, if you square them, you get the identity, and A and B commute. So a quick uh, caveat is just because there are elements in a group that satisfy the relations above does not mean that it actually is V4. So for example, the trivial group con consisting just of the do nothing element or the identity, it satisfies this, this presentation. And you could say, well, yeah, the trivial group, if we let A and B be equal to the identity, they are generated by the A and B. Well, clearly, the identity squared is the identity. The identity squared is the identity. And E times E equals E times E. So the trivial group satisfies that, right? Okay, so loosely speaking, the above presentation tells us that V4 is the largest group that satisfies these relations. More on this when we study quotients, although I will say some of it you won't see. Um, the proper way to uh, formalize group presentations really should be done in a graduate level class. Although it's a basic enough concept that I can introduce it here and you can understand it and it can be a nice intuitive tool that helps you understand and analyze groups. Here's an example from the previous lecture. So recall the freeze group that had the following Cayley diagram. Now we actually saw several freeze patterns that had this diagram, so we don't really know which one it is. Uh, one of them um, had the red arrows as the glide reflections and the blue arrows as the horizontal reflections, that is the reflections about a, a vertical axis. Although it could have been one of the uh, several other freeze groups that had the same Cayley diagram. So here's one presentation of this group. G is generated by T and by F. And F squared equals the identity, and TFT equals F. So here, we are saying that this is T, and this thing here is, is F. Now, T hints at translation. So, so maybe... Um, so maybe this was the freeze where this was the translation and this might have been like the rotation by 180. Remember that there, there was a freeze pattern that looked something like, let's see if I can do this, that looked something like this where the, uh, where the symmetries were generated by translations and then by 180 degree rotations. Um, but it doesn't matter. Th this is a Cayley diagram and it satisfies, so F squared is the identity. If you start here and you do F squared, you get back to where you started. You don't have any relations involving T squared or T cubed or anything like that because if you keep following T, you never get back to where you started. But you do have this relation here. So this says T F T equals F. So a good rule of thumb here is that any time that you have a, a closed loop that gets you back to where you started, that that is a relation. So I, instead, of, instead of this thing here, so I say one presentation in this group, instead of writing that, TFT equals F, I could have written TF equals FT inverse. So, so let me say that. Or TF equals FT inverse. That's a perfectly good substitution for this thing here. And I claim that there's a lot more closed loops. You could write t squared f, or you, you could write, yeah, let's try this. Uh, t squared f, t squared f is the identity. Um, so let's, let's try to write that down. t squared f, t squared f, sorry, my, that's not very good, is the identity. But I claim that you can actually deduce this rule from these two rules here. And I'll leave that as an exercise. 
okay, here's the Cayley diagram of another freeze group. Now we don't know which freeze group this is. Remember there were two freeze groups that were generated by a single element. One of them was generated by glide reflections. The other one was generated by translations. Here's the presentation. And you can think of this as um, G is generated by one element A subject to no relations. So you start here and you apply A, you are never going to get back to where you started. Let's finish with a few comments. So due to the aforementioned caveat and a few other technicalities, remember that caveat a few slides ago where I said that, well, technically the presentation says this is the largest group, whatever that means, that satisfies this. So anyways, the, the study of group presentations is a topic usually relegated to graduate level algebra classes. However, they are often introduced in an undergraduate algebra class because they are very useful, even if the intricate details are harmlessly swept under the rug. So the problem, which is called the word problem, of determining what a mystery group is from a presentation is actually computationally unsolvable. In fact, it is equivalent to the famous halting problem in computer science. And if you have not heard of the halting problem, this is a classic problem that um, People asked a few decades ago when computer science was just starting to become a field, they said, well, is, is it possible to design, to write a computer program that can tell you if your own computer program is going to halt? If it doesn't halt, that means it goes into an infinite loop. This would be a really useful thing to have. If you, if you ever programmed, one of the things you may remember is that it's very easy to write a bug and get into an infinite loop. So wouldn't it be great if there were like a debugger or some sort of checker that could tell you if your program is going to loop forever. And unfortunately, there is no such software. There is no such algorithm. It is impossible to write a program that can absolutely guarantee you with 100% certainty um, whether or not your program is going to halt or not. And actually, that is equivalent to the word problem in group theory. And that's an incredible uh, equivalence of, of two classic problems. So for Example, and mostly for amusement, what group do you think the following presentation describes? So I encourage you to uh, pause the lecture and see if you can draw a Cayley diagram or, or write out some words and just play with this a little bit and see if you can figure out what group this is. So it's a group generated by two elements, A and B. AB equals B squared A and BA equals A squared B. Ready? Want me to tell you? Surprisingly, this is the trivial group. In other words, the trivial group is the only group that has two elements, A and B, namely A and B are the identity, that also satisfy these relations.